it was kind of dicey. Um, my, I would wake up and I would see my wife and I would say, where am I? What happened? And she'd say, well, you're in the hospital. You had a heart attack. And I'd say, oh, okay. And then I'd, I'd drift off. And a couple minutes later, I'd wake up again and I'd say, where am I? What happened? And she'd explain it again. I had no short-term memory because of the lack of oxygen to the brain. They weren't sure I was going to come back. But in a couple of days, I could start remember remembering conversations from one moment to the next. And in five days, they sent me home. So let me uh, get back to my slide, share my screen here. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm disabled since I rejoined. If you can enable my screen sharing. I, I sure hope everybody is a patient with us here. I, this new technology is amazing, but uh, um, there's a learning curve. I'm clearly not not up the learning curve. Uh, am I, do I have screen sharing okay. yet? All right, let me try we this. We see you. We see you. Okay. All right. How's that? That's good. Okay. I'm not sure exactly when I got cut off, but uh, they, they weren't sure that I was mentally okay for the first day or so in the hospital. But then five days I was sent home, took another week off from work, and they did some uh, additional tests to make sure that I was not permanently damaged by this event. Of the 3% of the people who survive cardiac arrest, most of them have residual brain damage or heart muscle damage, or both. I seem to be okay uh, in the mental part, but um, when I forget my anniversary, I say, honey, it must have been the heart attack. <laughs> Couldn't have been something else. Uh, but they wanted to see if my heart muscle was permanently damaged, so they did some more tests. And the test came back negative. Yay, my heart muscle wasn't damaged. And the doc said, you can go back to your life the way it was. And I, at first I thought, that's great. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, my life the way it was had a heart attack in it. I don't want to go back there. And I started asking, was my life the way it was the cause of my problem? I didn't know. And I, but I, all of a sudden, I really cared about these questions. What causes heart disease? Can it be prevented or reversed? And that's caused me to dig into the research journals and uh, uh, embark on this journey of, of wonder in, in learning about heart disease. Eventually, I found my way to a gentleman by the name of Caldwell Esselstyn, who has a number of research papers, but also this book, which, which is very readable. It's called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. This is one of the books we'll offer you at the end as a possible choice for your coupon that we'll give to you. Um, the book Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. But um, in case you don't read that book, I'll share with you right now a few key items uh, from that book. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn says, uh, nearly half the people in the U.S. will suffer heart disease. Not all of them will die of it, but half the people will suffer from heart disease. And he says, you really need to know your cholesterol numbers, uh, both your total cholesterol and your LDL, and you should know what numbers are healthy. And th that's 150 and 80. So if your total cholesterol is be below 150, and your LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, is below 80 milligrams per deciliter, you're safe. You can sign off of the Zoom meeting right now. Uh, there's nothing I can say that will help lower your chances of having a heart attack because you won't have one. That is, if your numbers are below this, these numbers without medication. So if that's the case for you, great. Sorry to say the vast majority of Americans are not in this category. And if that applies to you, your numbers are higher than these, you can fix the problem yourself. This is a doctor saying doctors cannot fix the leading killer in this country. Now, this is either great news or horrible news. If you're the type of person who just wants to do whatever you please, and when something goes bad with your health, you'll go to the doctor and they'll fix it. This is a big problem because doctors cannot fix the leading killer in this country. But if you're the type of person who likes to take control of your life, you like to decide for yourself whether you're going to be sick or healthy, you want to decide for yourself whether you're going to live a long time or cut it short, this is awesome because you can control this. 
I love this message from Dr. Esselstyn. But if you don't fix the problem yourself, the medical establishment has a number of things they'd love to do to you or for you. They'll prescribe medications, a class of drugs called statin drugs. Trade names are Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor. Turns out those don't work very well. I'm gonna quantify that in a moment. And they have significant negative side effects, and we'll talk about that as well. The next thing the doctors may want to do to you is put in a stent or more than one. These are metal mesh tubes that are inserted uh, through leg or arm uh, into your heart artery and expanded in place and left there forever. Uh, they do upwards of a million of these a year in this country and they don't cure heart disease. Next thing they'll want to do is bypass surgery, coronary artery bypass graft, CABG, sometimes called cabbage, or just bypass surgery. We do half a million of those a year in this country and they don't cure heart disease. We spend 10 billion a year, this isn't million, this is a billion with a B on these drugs that aren't very effective. And by the time you add in the surgeries, it, it totals $50 billion on these interventions that just don't cure heart disease. Yet diet can prevent and reverse heart disease. Interesting. I believe that the reason that we've gotten to this situation, horrible situation in this country, is we don't have a good understanding, most of us, the relationship between what we choose to put in our mouth and what happens inside. After all, how could we know that? Because we don't see what happens inside. Once the food goes past our lips, we don't see it. Well, here's a, a doctor that's uh, going to give us a little bit of a clue here. He's looking at two blood samples, one from each of uh, two patients. The patient on the, who gave the sample on the left here adhered to the guideline uh, that uh, was given to them. And if you've gotten a blood test, you've probably gotten the same guideline, which is don't eat anything for 10 or 12 hours before the blood test. You may not know why they say that, but you will shortly. The patient who gave the sample on the right didn't adhere to that so much. Now, once the blood samples are taken, they're either put in a centrifuge or they're, they just let them set for a long time. So they separate into their individual components of the blood so that they can see those individually. This doctor is going to talk about uh, the, these two samples from two different patients. Now, normally, this liquid layer floating on top of the blood clot is quite transparent. It's a yellow, but quite clear. You can see right through it. The blood in this patient's tube, however, was anything but clear. The serum floating on his clot was thick and greasy white. It looked like glue. In fact, it stuck to the sides of the blood tube when I shook the tube. I went back to the patient. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital tonight? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized that what I was looking at in his tube was all the fat in the beef burger, all the butter fat in the cheese and the butter fat in the ice cream and in the milkshake. Now, here's the good news. If at some point in your life you've had a cheeseburger and a milkshake, your body has cleared that gunk away. But it took 10 or 12 hours to do that. Now, what do most Americans do before our bodies have gotten a chance to uh, spend that 10 or 12 hours and, and clear that away? We eat more of the same stuff. So most Americans are bathing the insides of their arteries with this gluey junk 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But still, your body is amazing. It can clear that away, and you don't even notice the buildup of the problem for years, decades even. For me, it was 52 years before it got to me. But eventually, it catches up to you. Now, let's take a look at the insides of this gentleman who uh, had this blood test. Now, we don't know for sure from these video sequences his regular diet, but we might guess that this wasn't his first milkshake and cheeseburger. And so after a lifetime of eating that way, let's take a look at the insides of his arteries. The next morning, we took Mr. Phillips to the operating room, and I put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest. And from these arteries, he began pulling out yellow, greasy deposits of fatty material called atherosclerosis. So I want you to keep this picture in your mind the next time you reach for a cheeseburger or a milkshake. This is what you're building up on the insides of your arteries. You also need to know that this rotor-rooter job that this guy's getting on his arteries doesn't fix him. 
In fact, they don't do this kind of surgery anymore at all because in the process of stripping out this uh, cholesterol uh, deposits, they're also stripping out the in, inner lining of his artery, leaving him much more diseased than he was before. So you can't fix this through surgery. Fortunately, there is another fix. But let's talk for a moment about cholesterol blood tests. There is naturally some cholesterol in your blood. Your liver produces a, a certain amount uh, in certain kind of cholesterol that is used throughout your body to make cell walls wherever your uh, cells are dividing and, and multiplying. So more or less all the time there's a little bit of cholesterol that needs to be in your blood and your liver produces it. The other source of cholesterol in your blood is through the animal products that you eat. No plant products whatsoever have cholesterol in them. So the dietary cholesterol comes from animal products that is meat, fish, cheese, dairy, eggs, even that though, the level of cholesterol in your blood at the moment isn't what causes your death. It's not like it's a poison that reaches a particular threshold and then you keel over. No, it's the cholesterol that's in your blood of the wrong kind over a long period of time that causes your death. And they've found that uh, because if you have cholesterol in your blood today at a high level, you likely had it high level yesterday and last week and last month, and so uh, it turns out that it's a pretty good indicator of your likelihood of death. The, the Framingham Heart Study established this correlation. Uh, that is, they found that people with higher cholesterol in the blood had a higher chance of dying of heart, heart disease. And so under most conditions, uh, I'll, I'll say uh, most with one exception we'll talk about in a moment, this marker is an effective diagnostic tool. That means you go to your doctor, you get the blood test, you see the numbers, and that's a pretty good indicator of uh, whether you're gonna die of heart disease. But you need to know what the right numbers are. We talked about that before. Uh, your total cholesterol needs to be below 150. Now, I'm a Kaiser Permanente patient, and if you go to Kaiser and get a blood test, it'll come back and it'll say, here's your number, your total cholesterol, and here's the guideline. And they say the guideline is 200. Now I asked Kaiser, you know, if, if the healthy number is 150, where did this 200 come from? And they said, oh, well, we get it from the American Heart Association. So I asked the American Heart Association, where do you get this guideline number? And they said, well, this is about the average of all Americans. Now think about this for a moment. This is an average among a group of people whose leading cause of death is heart disease. You don't want to be average, you wanna be healthy. So don't believe that 200 is okay. Uh, the Framingham Heart Study found that a third of the people with heart disease had cholesterol between 150 and 200. So being below 200 is certainly better than above. You'd rather be in the one-third category than the two-thirds, but don't believe that being under 200 is okay. In fact, I'm a great example of that. Wow, we're getting some echo there. Thank you. Um, I had uh, my last blood test before my cardiac arrest was my total cholesterol was 188. So if you think 200 is okay, I beg to differ. Now, there was a study that uh, was published in the research journals in 2010 that showed that statin drugs break the correlation. What does that mean? The correlation between the blood test measurement and likelihood of death. What it means is when you take these drugs, the cholesterol blood test goes down, but you still die nearly as often. Let me draw an analogy here. If you're draw, driving your car and the red check engine light comes on, you understand that the red light itself is not the problem. It's an indicator that there's a problem deep inside your engine, but you know you shouldn't ignore that. So you take your car to the mechanic and it comes back the next day and the check engine lights off and you go, yay, the mechanic fixed the problem. But then if you happen to look under the dashboard and you found the wire that goes to that red light and it looked like that, you might say, oh, in fact, the mechanic didn't fix the problem with my engine. He just disabled my indicator, making me think the problem was fixed and you would be pretty steamed at your mechanic. So that's what statin drugs are like. Don't let them fool you 
into thinking you're healthy just because your cholesterol blood test goes down when you're taking these drugs. Now, if these drugs really don't help you very much, why, why are we taking them? Well, it turns out that statins uh, inhibit the liver's natural production of cholesterol. It doesn't do anything for the cholesterol that's in your bloodstream because of the meat and dairy and eggs that you ate. So the bad, unnatural stuff doesn't do anything. The natural stuff produced by your liver, it keeps your liver from producing that stuff. So when you think about it that, like that, interfering with the natural function and not doing anything about the unnatural dietary problem that you have, it's maybe not so surprising that it doesn't help you very much in terms of longevity. And there are side effects, the biggest one being liver damage not a problem, you're introducing a toxin, a liver poison intentionally into your system to keep your liver from doing what it's supposed to. And guess what? That can often cause liver problems. It used to be that the fine print that you got with the statin drug said that if you take this drug for any length of time, you should take a standard liver test. And if the liver test shows damage, you should discontinue the medication. Well, the fine print doesn't say that anymore because they found that the standard liver test doesn't show up the damage to the liver caused by the statin drugs. Doesn't mean it's not happening, it just doesn't show up with the standard liver test. Another big uh, side effect to these statin drugs is muscle soreness, and this seems to vary quite a bit from person to person. Some have mild muscle aches, some more severe. And then finally, there's brain damage. And let me describe what I mean by that. It's a set of symptoms that look a lot like Alzheimer's, uh, concentration problems, short-term memory loss. Um, and I think everyone knows that Alzheimer's is a progressive disease that, and there's no known treatment that reverses it. But they're finding that a lot of people are presumed to have Alzheimer's and they're taking statin drugs. And when they get off the statin drugs, their cognition gets better. So in fact, the problem wasn't Alzheimer's at all, it was the statin drugs. The problem is, is uh, dose and duration dependent. That is, the longer you take statin drugs, the duration, and the higher the dose, the more you're gonna have brain problems. So this is uh, one of the most scary side effects for, for me. I ran across five different uh, studies over the years that were very interesting to me and eventually realized I could put them all on the same chart by uh, scaling to the baseline. That is, each of these uh, experiments has a control that is a, a um, group of patients that aren't being treated and the other group that is being treated. So I can match up all the non-treatments and compare them in this way. So the first study that I ran into was one about stents. These are these metal mesh tubes that they push into the arteries to put, push the clogs away. I've got some in my heart right now, wish I didn't. But um, so the, at Duke University, they had patients coming into their medical center for years, uh, candidates for stents, and they uh, de decided to split them into two groups and arbitrarily they would give stents to half of them and other group wouldn't get stents, but they, um, they'd uh, follow the two groups for years after to see how many of them died of heart disease. And what they found is the, the, they, they eventually published in this paper two death rates. I took those two numbers and put them on the graph the death rate for the group who didn't get treatment is my baseline 100% there. And the death rate for the group that did get the stents, I'm gonna show you to you in a moment. Now, if the stents were a very effective treatment, you'd expect that this death rate would be much lower. Here it is. 97% of the people that would die without a stent still die. This is a very highly ineffective treatment, but there it is. Well, what about these drugs? Next study I'm gonna show you is, uh, they took a group of people that all had high cholesterol blood tests and they gave half of them statin drugs and then they measured their blood again. Now we're not talking about death rate for the moment, we're talking about blood tests. So the group that uh, didn't get the drugs, their um, cholesterol blood test stayed pretty much the same at 100%. Applying the same scaling to the blood test for the group that got the drugs, 85% down, wow. Ladies and gentlemen, statin drugs work. They work to lower the blood test measurement. Do we care about the blood test measurement? 
only to the extent that the blood test measurement is representative of the death rate. Well, let's look at not the blood test, but let's look at the death rate. Now, so now I'm going to show you the results from this June 2010 study that I mentioned before. 65,000 patients, all at risk of heart disease, elevated cholesterol. Half of them took uh, the statin drug, half of them didn't. We're now back to death rate. The death rate for the group that uh, did not take the statins is 100% applying the same scaling to the death rate for the group that got the statins, we get this. 91% of the patients that would die without the statin drugs still die. Now the author of this study said uh, due to uh, error uh, bars within the, the study, we cannot conclude any benefit of statin drugs. Well, I'll, I'll back away from that statement and say mathematically the most likely is that it saves 9%. And uh, it wasn't uh, just a couple of years ago that uh, one of the medical, major medical groups in this country went forth with their recommendation to dramatically increase the prescription of statin drugs. Why, given how ineffective this thing is, well, a, a small percentage of a big number is still pretty big. In this country, about half a million Americans die every year of heart disease, 500,000. So if you could knock off 9%, that would be 45,000 people. That's quite a few. And we'd certainly love to save 45,000 people. The problem is uh, we don't know which 500,000 are gonna die this year. So to save that 45,000, we have to have tens of millions of Americans taking this medication that causes cognition problems, liver damage, muscle soreness, so that those 45,000 can live. But what's even worse to me about this is the doctors present these drugs to us as though they are the solution. And they, that uh, confidence that they exude about this treatment prevents us from looking further. Well, let's, you and I look further. There's a, there was a study in the UK where they ask people, what do you eat? And uh, most of the people there eat a Western diet, just like we do, that includes lots of meat and cheese and, and dairy, uh, eggs. Um, but as, like here, a small fraction of the people just don't eat meat. They identify themselves as vegetarians. They may eat uh, milk and cheese and eggs, but just no meat. Well, they uh, took this large group of people that they knew what their eating patterns were, and they look, uh, published a paper eventually over the years, what percentage or what was the death rate due to heart disease for the group who ate pretty much like we do in America, and I've scaled that to the baseline, and I've applied the same scaling to the death rate for the group who just cut meat out of their diet, and here it is. There's still a lot of red there, 65% of the people who would die with um, eating a standard diet still die, but if you look not the height of the red bar, but the height of the white above the red bar, uh, so the statin drug saved maybe 9%, this saves more than three times that amount. So the doctor should say, well, we can give you these statin drugs, mm, have a small benefit maybe uh, in terms of death rate, but a whole bunch of side effects that you don't want. Or you can just cut meat out and you get a uh, three times better improvement and no, none of these bad side effects. And some doctors are now saying this, but not nearly enough. Well, there's one more study that I, I want to tell you about, and this comes from Caldwell Esselstyn, the author of this book. In the book itself, he has an early version of this study, which I found fascinating, and I, I think you would too if you read the book. Uh, but he was criticized because it only had 18 patients, and he, he was drawing conclusions uh, on those based on those 18 patients. So he got with some other researchers, and they did a much larger study and included 200 patients. He brought each of them in one at a time and said, I really want you to uh, eat this particular way, and I'm going to share with you in a moment what that is. For now, we'll just call it the ideal diet. And he said to each patient, I think this is going to make a big improvement in your heart disease. And 90% of the patients said, yep, doc, I'm in. I'll do it. The other 10 said, no, you're asking me to give up things that I'm just not willing to give up in my diet. I'm going to continue eating the way I, I was. And he said, okay, but we'll keep you in the study and we'll, we'll track you. 
So they tracked for years uh, the, the people who made the change and those who didn't. They, they kept track not only of death, but deaths due to heart disease, but also heart attacks that didn't result in death, angina, uh, stent emplacements, and uh, bypass surgeries. So they had a tally of five different major cardiac events, and they published in their paper the cardiac event rate for the people who did not change their diet, and I took that number and scaled it to 100%. And I applied the same scaling to the cardiac event rate for the group who adopted this ideal diet. And I'm gonna show you the height of this red bar in just a moment, but before I do, I want you to each think to yourself, how low does that bar need to go before it's really important to you? Now, I think you'll agree that it needs to go below the height of the vegetarian bar. You know, if, if it turns out it's up higher than that, uh, well, we just won't do that, we'll do the vegetarian thing. But how low does it need to go before it's really important to you? You guys ready to see the height of that red bar? 1%. 99% of heart disease, essentially the entire leading killer in this country goes away if you eat the right things and avoid eating the wrong things. Astonishing, wow. Here's some evidence. These are pictures from his book. Here's a gentleman who had uh, not just one raggedy spot in his coronary artery like I did. He has this whole long raggedy section here. Happens to be in the left anterior descending coronary artery, the same coronary artery that I had my problem with, uh, often called the widow maker. Um, but they uh, could not stent this guy because of this long length here. And so they asked him to go on this ideal diet which he did, and two and a half years later, they took another picture of that same artery, and look at that. The problem is gone. No surgery, just a change in diet. Wow. So what is this diet? First, let's talk about the bad things. Red meat, you knew that. Didn't have to tell you that. It's been in the press for decades now about how damaging red meat is. But what you may not know is that pork, chicken, and fish are just as bad. Fish has a special toxin problem. But they're, all of these are bad because they have animal protein, which is bad for us, highly inflammatory, and animal fat, which is bad for us, causes deposits, especially enabled by the, the um, inflammation that is caused by the protein. So animal protein is bad for us, animal fat is bad for us. Together, they're the perfect storm that just ravages us top to bottom. What's even worse than meat is dairy, milk, butter, ice cream, cheese. Some uh, experts call cheese the most damaging substance on the planet. Eggs, why? Because they have animal fat and animal protein in them. Processed foods of all kinds are really not good for us. You know that. I showed the donut, but there's a whole category of uh, cookies, cakes, uh, hostess, ding-dongs, and so on. And then uh, this last one is a little bit of a surprise to many. Vegetable oil is really harmful to us. Now, I'm not saying that you should never eat these things. This is America, you get to choose what you eat. But I'm saying the science is really, really clear. If you choose to eat these on a regular basis, the most likely outcome for you is heart disease and you in the casket before your time, your choice. Or you could choose to eat these wonderful, colorful vegetables of all kinds, heavy emphasis on leafy greens, fruits in moderation, beans are awesome, whole grains, including corn, oatmeal, brown rice, white rice is okay, brown is better, whole wheat, not that processed white stuff please, but whole wheat. Potatoes are awesome nutritionally. People have uh, tried eating nothing but potatoes for months and they thrive. The problem with potatoes in our society is the company they keep. You take a healthy potato and you cook it in oil, you've made it unhealthy. You take a wonderfully healthy baked potato and you slather it with butter or cheese or sour cream, all of a sudden it's, it's unhealthy. Even better perhaps are sweet potatoes. There are societies on this planet that eat nothing but sweet potatoes, a complete food. Um, these people have no heart disease, no colon cancer. I'm not saying you should eat only these things, but I'm saying the science is really, really clear. If you choose to eat only these things, the most likely outcome is you living 14 to 20 more years, depending on which study you look at, 
and uh, you may get to see not just your kids grow up, but your grandkids. And the closest you come to the graveyard is when you go running through and you see the gravestones of the people who ate the stuff on the previous slide. Now, the, the longer life may not be the most important aspect of this diet. In this country, the average years of disability before death is about nine. And that's an average, not a max. So if you have somebody who keels over suddenly of cardiac arrest and has no disability before death, for the average to be nine, that means somebody must have 18 years of disability before death. So, but just in terms of averages, you can either have nine years of disability before death and then die, or you can have nine years without disability because the things that cause the disability are caused by those foods on the previous slide. You can have nine really great functional, healthy, productive, exciting years followed by 14 to 20 more functional, healthy years. That's your choice, the choice you're making when you decide what to eat. The researchers call this a low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. Vegan means no animal products, but there are some unhealthy vegan foods, so the researchers generally don't use that word very much. This diet, it consists of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes. No meat or fish, no eggs or dairy products. I'm really just saying in words what you saw in pictures in the previous slide. You really don't want to use any oils, including olive oil, no processed foods. That's where the whole comes from. That is, uh, maybe you would eat an olive or two, but you don't eat the oil pressed out of 200 olives uh, and, and pour that you know, tablespoon of of oil onto your salad. So no processed foods. The low fat comes here. You really want less than 10% of your calories from fat. Some of the experts would say 7% uh, is maybe ideal. How do you achieve that without counting? Well, the first thing you get rid no, of- it's the, legitimate the, and I did it, so it's okay. The meat and the dairy I'll let you and know. oils. I'll let you know <clears throat> as it progresses. Thank you for that comment. Um, so, uh, the, to get the 10% from fat, you really want um, to get the meat, fish, eggs, oils out, but there are a very small number of high fat whole plant foods that you also want to be careful with. And that includes nuts and seeds, coconut and avocado. So I, I put this guideline in gray instead of black. It's not quite as strong a guideline and I put this asterisk. That is, if you're totally healthy, your cholesterol is below 150, your LDL is below 80, your blood pressure is below 120 over 80, your blood sugar is below 100, all of these with no medications, and your weight is in the normal range, not overweight or obese, you can safely have a little bit of nuts, coconut, and avocado, but not a lot. Be careful with these things. They're really high fat. And be cautious with soy products. If they're whole soy, fine. They can actually be beneficial. But uh, there's a lot of vegan meats, fake meats that are made from highly processed soy protein, and those aren't so healthy. And be careful with fruit juice. A little bit in cooking is fine, but don't drink uh, gallons of that per day. Now here's uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, and this is what he says about um, th this diet, which uh, sometimes people attack. He says, uh, some people think whole food plant-based diet is extreme. Half a million people a year will have their chest opened up and a vein taken from their leg and sewn onto their coronary artery. Some people would call that extreme. So when you think of it like that and imagine this buzz saw uh, cutting open your chest bone, then maybe you would say, hey, you know, eating some broccoli isn't that extreme after all. Here's another quote from Kim Williams, uh, president of the American College of Cardiology. He says, there's two types of cardiologists, vegans and those who haven't read the data. What he means by that is the data is really clear as to how harmful eating animal products is, but he doesn't mean that all the cardiologists understand that. So you need to understand this yourself and protect yourself from the doctors who don't really, haven't read the data. Uh, talked uh, just briefly about cancer. Uh, it's the second biggest killer in the U.S. Most of us probably have cancerous cells in us right now. We produce, uh, as adults, we produce about one new one a day, but our body has defense mechanisms that keep those from growing into tumors that get large enough to hurt us. But every once in a while, one of those 
uh, cancerous cells gets by all our defenses and grows for 10 or 20 or 30 years or more, and then it's detected, and then shortly thereafter, maybe it kills us. Uh, with consistent diet, the doubling rate remains constant, but you can change that. You can make your cancer grow slower, and sometimes you can even reverse the growth of cancer. Now, this is not quite as dramatic as heart disease, where you can just get rid of 99% of it, and it depends uh, a lot on what cancer and how soon you make the change. If you wait 10, 20, 30 years until that cancer is big, you don't have nearly as uh, good a chance as if you make the change before you're even aware that that cancer is in there. But uh, if you do make the change, many but not all lives can be saved through this dietary change. Here's uh, some of the data that starts to tell us what we should be eating to avoid cancer. You can see that the, the countries that have, um, uh, they eat more animal fat, uh, they have more breast cancer. The, the uh, countries that eat more meat have more colon cancer. Uh, there's a lot of experts now that think it's actually the animal protein that's uh, causing the cancer, but you know, it really doesn't matter whether it's the meat as a whole or just one component of it, fat or protein, all of those come together when you eat meat. And the best way to avoid cancer is to avoid eating meat or dairy. Here's some experiments that were done uh, in India quite a number of decades ago that also give us clues as to uh, the effect of diet. Now these uh, rats were injected with aflatoxin, which uh, causes uh, liver cancer, and they broke the animals into two groups. One group, uh, they gave an ordinary rat diet, uh, and they added 5% milk protein. And they found that 100% of these animals lived their normal life, had normal coats, normal behavior, yay. The defense mechanisms that these animals had fought off the induced cancer. By, through the aflatoxin injection. The other half were given the exact same diet, but they boosted up the milk protein, casein, uh, by about, to about 20%, and they found that 100% of the animals died. Wow. Uh, Colin Campbell, who is a, a nutritionist at Cornell University, uh, encountered this study, and he found it was fascinating. He, like most researchers at the time, thought that the more protein you ate, the better off you were. So this was quite surprising. He reproduced this experiment at Cornell. It's been since reproduced in other universities and labs and various places, result the same. Uh, increase in milk protein increases cancer death. But he wanted to go beyond this and he wanted to understand where in the life cycle of cancer did uh, this milk protein in the diet matter? So we ran uh, another experiment. This time, instead of keeping his test rats on the same diet throughout the study, he kept them in one group and switched their diets back and forth between five and 20% dairy protein, doing so at three week intervals. The results were astonishing. Whenever the rats were fed 20% protein, early liver tumor growth exploded. But when the same rats were given 5% protein, tumor growth actually went down. Wow. So it really doesn't matter when in the life cycle of the cancer it is. Uh, if you um, consume dairy products, it's like pouring gasoline on the fire of cancer. It just uh, increases it dramatically. So avoid those uh, dairy proteins. Colin Campbell uh, says this, uh, based on those experiments, says uh, casein, the main protein of cow's milk, is the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified. Wow. Uh, let's talk about diabetes real quick. Type 1 diabetes has a very strong correlation with milk, cow's milk consumption. We could talk about why if we had more time. Type 2 diabetes is a different disease. It has uh, one of the same symptoms, elevated blood sugar, but it's cause uh, is different. And it's not caused by eating carbohydrates, as you may have heard. It's caused by eating fat. The fat goes into your muscle cells and interferes with their ability to take in glucose. And the result is a progressive disease that uh, progresses to amputation, blindness, and painful death. Here's a gentleman who had uh, gangrene, diabetic gangrene on his heel. 
uh, shortly after this picture was taken, that uh, foot was amputated. Uh, you can try to address this with a diet recommended by the American Diabetes Association, and it helps a little bit, generally not enough to actually cure you. But if you take on this ideal diet that we just described, it's three times better in terms of the, the research results in lowering blood sugar. And that uh, three times better is enough that it usually results in a cure within two to four weeks. This is an epidemic disease, diabetes type 2, that leads to these painful deaths. And it can be usually reversed in two to four weeks with, with diet. Wow. Here's uh, Dean Ornish, a doctor in Northern California, who's been reversing uh, diabetes and uh, heart disease for 30 years in his patients. He says, think about it. Heart disease and diabetes are completely preventable by making comprehensive lifestyle changes without drugs or surgery. They're neat. High blood pressure has the same sort of story. It's caused by uh, this restriction in your heart, in your arteries. Uh, that stress shortens your life. The medications lower the blood pressure, but they don't solve the root problem. But diet solves it, and quickly too. If, you're, if you decide to fix your high blood pressure problem through diet, be ready to taper off your meds quickly. Either do it with the doctor or, or do the test yourself. Don't get on this great diet and then keep taking your blood pressure meds for a month. You may end up with too low a blood pressure and that could be dangerous as well. Here are the Center for Disease Control's top 15 sources of uh, causes of death in this country. Heart disease is the biggest one, cancer's right behind. I group these not according to size, but according to whether they are food related or not. So we know heart disease, most of that goes away if you eat properly, cancer most, but not all. Stroke goes away, type two diabetes, blood pressure goes away. Sorry, accidents, suicides, and murders uh, don't necessarily go away. Infections, which in COVID we're very uh, aware of right now, uh, there are always some deaths from that, uh, not particularly food related. Just for scale, by the way, um, we're expecting 200,000 COVID deaths this year. Uh, that would be uh, heart disease, from maybe a pie slice from about here to here. So heart, heart disease is still two and a half times greater than uh, COVID deaths, even this time. But anyway, back to food. If I add up all the pie slices here that are uh, the deaths caused by our food choices, turns out it's about two thirds. Uh, this is 1.3 million Americans die every year due to our unhealthy food choices. So I can't say for sure that you'll die if you don't get on this healthy diet, healthy diet, but there's a two-third chance that you will. So I urge you, please make a change. And this right diet can prevent a whole host of uh, different diseases, many we haven't even talked about. And the great news, it's the same diet that uh, fixes so many of these problems. Um, I'm gonna just blow through this real quick, but uh, you may have be wondering without meat, where are you gonna get your protein? Well, it turns out you need uh, somewhere between 2.7 and 4% of your calories uh, throughout the day to be protein, this gray bar. But many foods uh, ex extend beyond that, including ones that we think of as starches, even vegetables, and of course, peas and beans. So, you know, we don't have to work hard to get uh, to the right of this gray bar. Uh, almost all foods give us all the protein we need. So don't worry about that at all. In addition to a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat, and lots of complex carbohydrates, we need minerals and micronutrients. Here's a list of all the things we need. And I'm happy to say that all of these but two can be provided by plants. B12 is produced by bacteria, so you might wanna supplement with that just a little bit. D, is our bodies can produce uh, when we're, we have sunlight on them. So get a little sunlight, um, maybe supplement a little bit of B12. Please don't supplement these other things that puts the body out of whack. But a little bit of B12, some sunlight, and eat plants. There's absolutely no dietary component that is essential to us that comes only from animals. So here's my prescription for your long life and health. Uh, learn everything you can. The fact that you're here is great, but since this is a... Um, 
a topic that is associated with two thirds of the deaths in this country, I think it'd be worth it to you perhaps to dig in a little bit more and, and go beyond this, this workshop and learn some more. Um, and because your doctor probably didn't get any training in uh, nutrition when he was in medical school, uh, you need to be no more than he does about the relationship between nutrition and health. Once you learn what you need to do from a dietary standpoint, make the change. There's gonna be challenges, but you can overcome them. And I ask you at some time, help others through these three steps. I'm trying to help others. Uh, you can help us uh, perhaps through a donation. Uh, this is my website here, uh, newside.org. I'm gonna put some of this information into the chat log near the end, so you don't need to be scribbling anything down. But the uh, new SI is short for a Nutrition Science Foundation. And this is our website, um, lists uh, a number of books and videos that you might be interested in. We've got some recipes. If you want to find a doctor that really understands plant-based nutrition, there are a few of them, uh, and you can uh, find them here. If you want uh, motivation, we have some success stories, some in video form and some in written form of people whose lives have been turned around uh, based on adopting a plant-based diet. And again, if you'd like to help us uh, be able to give out more books, uh, we would love a donation. These are what I think are the, the top uh, educational resources. This first one is a DVD, Forks Over Knives uh, documentary. Uh, hi I highly recommend it. The China Study by Colin Campbell would be my top pick, uh, written by the Cornell University professor. We also have a, a Spanish version of that. And uh, I've, I've mentioned Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. The first half of this book is about the science. The second half is a cookbook. Similarly for the starch solution by John McDougall, the first half is the science, the last half is a cookbook. If you or anybody you know has diabetes, they really need to read this book so they really understand the cause of diabetes and how to get rid of it. If you still think you might want to eat meat, you might want to get a hold of this book, Mad Cowboy, written by a former cattle rancher. Uh, you will be surprised by what you're eating in that meat. If you just want to lose weight, The Plant Advantage is a good one. Uh, and if you just want a cookbook, how do you cook healthy but really tasty stuff, you might want to try this Better Than Vegan book. Here's my uh, three thoughts for you in terms of action plans for success. The first one is you do it yourself. Uh, read one of the books uh, recommended. I'm gonna give you a coupon. Uh, you can get one of those for free. Uh, read it cover to cover. And then take your medical measurements so you know what your baseline is. Then plan, do a trial week of eating plants. Not everything you eat uh, that's whole food will you plant-based will you like but do some trials. If you're cooking for yourself, find out which things you, you can, uh, are easy for you to cook and that you also like to eat. Once you know what you're gonna eat, then go all in. Do a 90 day challenge. I'm not gonna eat any animal products during this 90 days, no oils. Um, and at the end of that 90 days, take your measurements again. If you have found that your weight is down, your energy's up, your cholesterol's down, your blood sugar's down, and by the way, you really liked eating these foods, you might decide that this is something you can do for the rest of your life and be really healthy and live a long time. But if you don't want to study and you don't wanna cook, uh, you can do what I do, which is uh, I order from uh, Little Green Forks. Uh, they deliver to San Gabriel Valley, including Sierra Madre five days a week and further outside of LA and Orange County uh, one day a week. This food is, a call, of course, all whole, whole plant-based, no added oil. And um, here are some of the dishes that I like. Again, you don't need to write down this um, uh, web address. I'll be putting that in the chat log later. I love uh, burgers and fries. That's a bean oatmeal burger. Sweet potato bowl is awesome. Uh, there's a bunch of salads, including a Southwest salad, a lot of soups, broccoli soup. Pad Thai is one of my favorite. This is a, a pumpkin spice pudding that actually doesn't have any pumpkin in it. It has sweet potatoes in it, but it tastes like pumpkin pie and it's very healthy. I love it. 
So that's uh, the second way is just order food. A third way, if you need more help, we've created this organization called Tanner Care, and we deliver 25 and 75 hour long programs uh, that are spread over a year. We focus on the nutrition education yeah, to do. and uh, including uh, what to eat and what not to eat. We focus a lot on typical challenges. The, the intensive 75 hour program adds group support, mobility and strength training and one-on-one -on -one access to our professional staff that includes a, a doctor, a physical therapist, two nutritionists, a, a, a nurse and uh, the director and also yoga instructor, Petra. Our first cohort had an average loss of weight during the year of 18 pounds, and a lot of other uh, things got better as well. We started um, more recently a smaller program that uh, aims at uh, moderate weight loss and diabetes prevention, so, uh, 25 sessions, so a third of the, the content. And uh, it may be covered by insurance. So if you're interested in that, I'd suggest you talk to the director, Petra Poshman. I'll show her uh, uh, phone number in just a moment. If you want to learn more, some upcoming events. We have a nutrition workshop uh, via Zoom, very much like this one, just a little bit longer. If you want to hear it, this material again or you want to invite somebody else, I encourage you to go to our website and, and uh, sign up for, for that workshop. If you need food delivered to you five days a week, you can do that through Little Green Forks. And here's a coupon code. Again, I'm gonna put this in the chat, but you can get $15 off on your first order of $30 or more with this coupon code through this website, Little Green Forks. The Tanner Care programs are starting up uh, soon. Of the basic ones and then the more intensive one is starting up uh, in a little over a month. And uh, if you're interested in any of those, uh, please call Petra at this phone number. So I have one thought to leave you with uh, before I, I sign off. Um, a, a lot of people tell me, yeah, but I can't eat a bacon cheeseburger, uh, but I love it. And I have to admit that when I see this picture, even though I haven't had one of these in 10 years, it looks good to me. But if you eat it, you're, you're going to get sick and die. But why is that important? It, it, so it basically comes down to, is there anything in your life that is more important to you than the good taste of this burger? Uh, so I put it on a scale for you, and there's a big question mark on the right-hand side. I have something in my life that is worth more than the biggest pile of cheeseburgers ever, and that's my family, my wife and my three kids. They are uh, so much more valuable to me than the taste of those burgers. And the thought I want to leave to you uh, right now is, what is it in your life that is worth more than a cheeseburger? Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have time for questions, or have I consumed all of my available time? Greg, you make that call, please. Do you, do you hear my comments? Uh, John, I hear you. Okay. Um, Greg, are you there? We're going to call on you to uh, make the decision about uh, questions. Okay, I just unmuted myself. I was talking, but I was just talking to myself. Yeah, we're going to ask a couple, we're going to answer a couple questions here that came in. First question, let me find it. Um, let's see here. Are, carbo are carbohydrates like diabetes taken into account? Are medications taken for other issues also taken into account? Taken into account. I'm not sure what that means. Um, I think this was in the aspect of the research that was done um maybe we can have uh the person uh join us here n a l i n i if you can open up your mic and ask the question that would help us right now answer your question 
Yes, I meant if the patients that you were talking about, they had other comorbidities. Welcome. The heart mm -hmm. or high cholesterol levels. That's wrong. They're showing us a graph. They can set it. So also have other also, sometimes patients take medications that can also affect uh, you know normal physiology of a patient. Um, so I'm not sure ex exactly um, how to how to answer this. Um, so do do medications and food uh, both have a role? I mean, maybe that's the, the question. I mean, the to the to me the most astonishing thing is that if you eat the right things. 99% of heart disease goes away and doesn't matter what medications you're you're on the food by itself uh, gets rid of that disease i mean so you know do you want to continue to take the medications uh, you i suppose you you could if you wanted to but um, i'm not sure why you would want to uh, have all those negative side effects of those medications when you can fix your problem just with food. Does that does that make any sense? I'm not sure I addressed the question. By the way, I put some of this, the information into the chat log for uh, phone numbers and, and uh, websites for further information. John, Sally asks, uh, when you're talking about, I think, statins, Yes, what about if high cholesterol is genet uh, genetic? My father had high cholesterol and he died at 45. Can I really override this by changing my diet? The, the short answer to that is yes. Longer answer is genetics make a little bit of difference, but they've found that um, in various situations, genetics have maybe a three or 4% effect on the result. The biggest effect is the food. The, what you eat actually turns on your certain genes and turns off other genes. So it's not a death sentence to have a, a particular genetic pattern. Often uh, f um, illnesses like heart disease go in families and people assume that that's genetic. Well, but the eating patterns run in families too. And, you'd, uh, and that's much more likely the cause of diseases running rampant in certain families. So the fact that your parent died of heart disease doesn't mean that you have to, not at all. Yes. Okay, so John, we have another question. Uh, this question is, a, a, we haven't talked about this. Samuel asks, how beneficial is apple juice in fighting COVID? That's the thing they can hear is what's coming from me. Um, I haven't, haven't heard that one. But um, you want to know what you need to do to fight COVID. Well, it turns out the, the um, co complicating factors that lead to COVID deaths are typically heart disease, diabetes, obesity, the very things that a plant-based diet gets rid of. And so um, if you eat a whole plant diet, not just apple juice. Don't pick out one component. That's not that's not going to do much for you. But your entire diet, you get rid of all the inflammatories that come from the animal products. You get all the healthy phytochemicals that come from the plants, and you get rid of the heart disease um, and diabetes and and obesity. That means your survival rate, if you get the disease, is much much greater. It's the people who are who are already sick with these other things that are dying mostly from COVID. Mm. John, we want to thank you. The, um, my testimony is I've been plant-based. I, I lived in Dubai for a while and for three years. I fell down. I had to have a test done on my heart and they tested my heart and the doctor came back. It was an MRI and he said, your, your arteries are completely clear. And I'm 62 years old, and so I'm really, really thankful about that. Now, 
we want to uh, transition to our health presentation. And I'm gonna let John Jensen introduce the person that is going to be sharing with us. Um, uh, before I go, can I make one more comment? Sure. Um, I forgot to tell you how, how to get your free book. I'm sorry. Can I uh, quickly share my screen again? I did put the information into the chat log, but just to, to put it up on the screen, um, what I would uh, invite you to do, let's see, can everybody see that? Yes. Oh, it's sure. a, little, a little bit bigger. So no, send me. email to this address, mention this event, Sierra Madre Seventh-day Adventist event, and then uh, we'll send you a coupon. You'll choose one of the, either this DVD or one of these books, and then we'll mail it to you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. We appreciate your, um, your initiative that you're trying to do to help other people become aware of what they eat has a direct influence on their health. And that's come through loud and clear. I'm really thankful that you were able to join us today. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to the food demo. Let's bring Absolutely. it on. So a number of people are asking about the recording of this presentation. We have a web, a web, a landing page called, um, John, what's our, what's our page called? It's called gethealthy.la. Gethealthy.la. And this will be placed uh, on that whereby you can watch it over again. To John Jensen and our health presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanner. It's really a pleasure to have you present this amazing a lecture and we look forward to hopefully doing this again with you. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Anna Evans and Anna is this beautiful lady here next to me. She has been plant-based since 2009. She started attending similar lectures and similar classes as this one back in our church in Redondo Beach back in 2009 and now she has become an amazing plant-based chef, cook, uh, recipe creator, and uh, cooking instructor extraordinaire. And so she's going to demonstrate two recipes for us today. And you can get those recipes, download them, if you go to gethealthy.la right now. And if you see there's on the left-hand side of the home page, down, uh, part way down, is a place that says click on these links and you can download the there are two recipes but you just have to click the one uh, link and it will download both of those recipes for you you can print them off if you'd like to and then you'll be able to follow the instruction very well so please join me in welcoming Anna thank you thank Anna. you thank you hi this is Anna from Anna's inspirational healthy kitchen and I um, had a little trouble picking which recipes today, but uh, we're gonna have a tasty broccoli casserole. And of course I figured you would want a dessert, a treat, a healthy treat, that is my peanut butter and jelly bars. So uh, like John said, I was driving down the street about 11 years ago, and I saw the um, sign for uh, vegetarian classes back then and I thought well I could learn to cook vegetables a little different so I went over signed up and took their classes and then I found out how bad meat was from the lecturer and dairy and uh, came home and told my husband we have to change so we changed and here I am years later uh, we changed drastically our kids were already living out on their own but when they would come for holidays or their birthday dinners, I told them, this is how we eat. This is the food you're getting. Within six months, they loved the food so much that they changed. And so they, they eat this way also, plant-based. And we just have more energy than we had. I, I think I have more energy than in my 20s. So my husband's back to running. He had stopped running because when he got older, his knees hurt so bad. Um, and he had also been on an inhaler for years for asthma, and he stopped taking the inhaler with no problem. He runs about four miles on Saturday and four miles on Sunday. He's never used an inhaler again because he's never had a problem. 
knees don't hurt, nothing hurts. And um, we just feel good. We want everybody else to. That's why I love creating recipes and sharing them. Uh, I would get discouraged sometimes. I'd work a couple hours in the kitchen in the beginning. And then I would sit down to eat this recipe that I had followed and it was disappointing. It just didn't taste that good. So I started creating my own and today I picked a really good one for transitioning. Because in the beginning when you transition, if you try to go too, too strict, sometimes, you know, eliminating all oil and sugar and salt and everything, it just doesn't taste good and you don't stick to it. So that's really important. My recipes have three requirements. They have to, of course, taste tasty and delicious, but they have to be quick and easy. I've found from my family and friends that if they're not quick and easy, most people won't spend the time to do it. And the third one is I like to have ingredients that I have in my house, everyday ingredients, not really strange things that I have to go buy for a recipe and just use it once or twice. So we're gonna get started. For the casserole, we're gonna make my no nut cheese is gonna go in that. And my daughter, as she got older, has developed an allergy for nuts. And most of my cheese sauces have cashews that make it creamy. So she was here for visiting and I was making my stuffed pasta shells, which I make a ricotta um, cheese to stuff them with. So I needed to change the cheese sauce. So I created a no nut cheese sauce that I pour a little bit in the bottom and then put the stuffed shells in and then on top. But this sauce is real versatile. You can use it on um, a nacho salad that I make. I put it on top or nacho pizzas. I use it for the sauce on a pizza. But today we're gonna use it in the broccoli casserole. So what it calls for it, is- Anna, can we? Yes. We see you, Anna, can we see you? We're not seeing you. We're, we're, oh, I see me. <laughs> we're, yeah, but we're, we're- They're not seeing me. We, we saw glimpses of you earlier, but we're not seeing you. Okay, I, thank you. I can see her fully. Oh, okay. yeah. You can see me, guys? You have to slide your finger across her. the screen. You have to, like, if you're watching on a phone, just slide your finger across the screen so you see the other view. Okay. And then Press on that. Go. Go. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna put the 16 ounce jar of the picante sauce in. Now, as you probably know that picante sauce comes in um, medium or hot. Uh, of course, we're opposite, my husband and I, and I, he likes spicy, the hotter the better, but I can't handle it, so I like medium. So that's what I happen to use in my sauce. And I am using a can of the coconut cream in there to make it creamy and a little bit of sweet. And then it's going to call for a third of the nutritional yeast, which um, is really good. It makes your stuff, if you're not familiar with it, it makes it have that um, tasty cheese flavor to it. And it calls for a um, tablespoon of garlic powder. So I'm going to put all that in, and that's all there is to it. Really, a few ingredients, quick and easy. And then you just want to blend it in your blender until it's creamy, you know, mixed well. So that's it for the sauce. And um, then I already did things ahead of time to save time. So the rice is cooked already, the wild rice. And I really, this one here, the Lundberg, for some reason is my favorite. I've tried a lot of blends of rice blend, uh, wild rice, but this particular one I just love. You can get it at Sprouts or Pavilions has it possibly whole, whole foods I haven't checked there. Oh yeah, they do. Excuse me, they do have it. But this is my favorite. It's the very best tasty, in my opinion. So I cooked this earlier today. So this is the two cups of the wild rice. And you're just gonna follow your package directions and cook it according to how the package tells you. I'm gonna put that in my big bowl. 
and then you want to use this is about how much broccoli that you use a couple of the stalks because what I found is when we uh, make this and eat it we like it to be on the saucy side real saucy and the more broccoli and mushrooms and red bell peppers that you put in then it won't be as saucy so I don't use too much of these things but just just enough so you don't want to overdo that. I've done it before and it comes out kind of dry. And then what I did is I used one package of the little boxes that you can buy, the containers, and I sliced the mushrooms. So we're going to put that in. And then you want to use either one or two bell peppers, depending on the um, size they are. And uh, what I've learned is the the three seem to be sweeter than the four little nodules. I guess the three are females and the four are males. So I always try to go for the three because that's why I'm putting the bell peppers in to make it sweet. So once all of that's in there, your broth, two stalks of broccoli, your container of mushrooms sliced, and one to two bell peppers depending on the size. That's what it's gonna look like before we add the cheese sauce. Now what I love about this is the red and green I have decided is gonna be my traditional Christmas casserole because it's in the Christmas colors. So this is a good dish you could make for a potluck with friends and family that still eat meat and dairy. They will not even know that this is you know, a, a healthy meal. They'll eat it, they'll love it because it will taste so good. So it's good for potlucks with a mix of people. So once I do that, then I'm going to add the cheese sauce that we just made. And if you don't have one of these handy tools, you need to get one because they're really nice for getting every last drop of the sauce out. Okay. And then that's all there is to it. You're gonna just mix it up, stir it up real good. And then we're gonna put it in a nine by 13 inch casserole dish. We're gonna cover it with foil and we're gonna bake it at 375 for about 40 to 45 minutes. Now how I test to see if it's done, I will pull back the foil and take a fork and stick the fork into the broccoli. That's the main thing you want to, is where the broccoli is soft and that's how you like it. Um, I don't like my broccoli mushy, so I want the broccoli to just be kind of medium done. So that's basically it for the tasty broccoli casserole. Then you'll just put it in the pan. It makes a lot too. <laughs> A really lot. So it's nice and filling. It could even be a main dish if you wanted to. And there you have it. It's nice and tasty and um, I don't think Healthy cooking gets much quicker or easier than this. So that, that would be it. And then like I said, I would just pull the foil and put it on top. Did you get a picture of that? Yeah? Doesn't that look yummy? It's really, really good. I tested this on a lot of people. It's the one that my husband requested all the time. He loves it. So that's about it for that one. So um, I'm gonna get on, move on to the dessert. So I'm just gonna make a really quick sweep of this and bring the other stuff over. So yeah, just all of this over. As we're making the transition, I wanna share with everyone that after um, we receive permission from the health authorities, we are going to start having these at a local site. When we do that, the health presenter will be there, 
we'll have the cooking demonstration, and then we'll have samples for everyone to test. We'll serve all those up, we'll, you know, we'll follow sanitation protocols, but that's our ultimate goal to be able to have this live uh, in front of a live audience. It'll be in Sierra Montre. Um, you can find the address on our website, gethealthy.la. Uh, and uh, we're nonprofit. We, we do not have a profit motivation. Our motivation is to serve the community with uh, health awareness. So you'll be welcome to come. You can find out those updates on our website, gethealthy.la. So what do you want me to do with these cores? Can I throw it away, the cores? Yeah. Okay. Are we ready? Okay, yeah. we're gonna move on to our dessert. It's my peanut butter and jelly bars. So to start with, we need to make the crust in the food processor. Gotta plug it in here. In the light. And so I already measured the cup of oats out. So these are ones I get rolled oats from Trader Joe's. So you're gonna put a cup of oats in there. Whoops. Let me put that aside. And then um, the dates, I already softened those earlier today. So if you don't know, you just it's good to boil water, turn it off, put your dates, and let them soak for about 30 minutes and that will make them soft. And that's what we want for in here. But also too, you wanna to make sure that you pit them, if they have pits in them. But even so, if they say pitted dates, I still cut them all open and double check because sometimes there's one that sneaks and gets in there and you'll mess up your food processor. So it's about nine to 10 baked dates depending on their size. Trader Joe's has good organic pitted dates that work real well. And then I'm gonna put in three-fourths a cup of walnuts. And then it's um, one teaspoon of vanilla in there. And that's all there is for the crust. That's all, all the ingredients. And then I'm just going to basically um, pulse it a few times. I want it to um, sort of start balling up I don't want to over pulse it and have it be like gooey because it's going to be the crust and the crumbly top. So. so I'll just kind of pulse it on and off a few times just until it kind of starts to stick together. Like you can see it's starting to do now. So let me check it. And that's about perfect right there if you can get in here see how it kind of sticking but it's still crumbling so we don't we don't want that gooey so um I, oh there's my rag <laughs> wash rag okay so the crust is ready that easy so what we're going to do what i like to do is take some out for the top because if i don't do that sometimes i forgot and i have it all make it in nothing left to put on top. So I'm gonna just take about a fourth out. I'm just, I'm just gonna eyeball it, just what I think is enough to go on top. And then the rest, I'm gonna push into my um, eight by eight pan with the parchment paper. And I'm using my hands. I washed them, they're clean, but <laughs> only my husband and I are eating this, so it's okay. So I'm gonna take and push it like this to get a bottom crust in there. So these are pretty healthy and they're nice when you're having a craving for something sweet, especially when you're first transitioning and you're missing all of that junk food that you used to eat. <laughs> but it's worth it because you will feel so good and have so much energy and I love it when we go to the doctor at our age and uh, he says, what medications are you on? We go for a checkup and I'm like, nothing. And he looks at us like, you know, are you lying? People your age, <laughs> they all take medications. I'm like, we take nothing. We don't even need an aspirin. We don't get headaches. We feel great. So it's awesome way to eat. And especially when the food tastes good. It should taste good or you shouldn't have to eat it. You shouldn't have to have food that doesn't taste good. So what um, I like, again, I, I, they, 
my friends always tell me you should do commercials for Trader Joe's, but I really like their um, organic peanut butter because the only ingredients in it is peanuts. And um, it's important that you have organic. And you can use creamy or crunchy in this, but I like that little bit of crunch. So we're gonna put a, just a half a cup in here. You just want enough to get, you know, that peanut butter flavor across the whole top. So that's about a half a cup. And then I'm just gonna take it and smooth it across the crust. Doesn't it look good already? <laughs> So there you have that layer with the peanut butter. And then what I use for the jelly is the, um, again, Trader Joe's has the organic raspberry fruit spread and they also make strawberry too. And I like these, again, the fruit spread because they have nothing added except the fruit and the grape juice to sweeten it. So there's no sugar or anything. I like using the raspberry because um, it's a prettier red. <laughs> it's bright red. But um, my mom had asked one time, I was going to take her to these at the board and care she was in. And I said, Mom, what do you want? I'm going to make you my bars. What flavor? And she said, apricot. And I'm like, oh, Trader Joe's doesn't have apricot. So I went to the Ralph's near here and I did find this brand, which again is an organic and it's apricot and it is a fruit spread, only has the, the uh, grape juice to sweeten it too. So that's the nice thing is you can vary the flavors and make it different each time too. So I'm gonna use this whole jar and spread it on top of the peanut butter. And again, this would be a really good recipe if you're transitioning and also to take to a gathering with family and friends that don't eat this way, they would never know that it's anything healthy, they would think it was a sugar dessert and they would gobble it right up. And that's what I like a, my recipes to be, is recipes that everyone will eat and enjoy and think that they really taste good. And so that, there you have it with the jelly on top, well, fruit spread, <laughs> really. And then you're just gonna take what you set aside and just take little pinches like this. This is probably the longest part of the whole thing that you're making that takes the longest because I, you know, I get real perfectionist with this stuff <laughs> and it has to be even. <laughs> so you're just gonna cover the whole top with these little crunchy things and they'll kind of spread out when it's cooking. And, uh, so yummy, especially when they're warm. That's the best, right out of the oven. Oh, so good. Yeah, so our whole family eats this way now, and my kids, um, gosh, they've done that a couple times, the 500, uh, uh, 500 mile, I believe it is, the ride from, San, five days they ride from San Francisco to LA on their bikes. Um, they're both in their 40s. And they um, do long distance bike riding. They do weight training. I mean, they're just very, very athletic and they do it all on eating plant-based. So, you know, it can be done. There you go. That's what it looks like before it's baked. It's gonna go in the oven and bake at 350 for about 30 minutes. And then you'll just cut it into little squares. And then you can refrigerate it. Don't eat it all at once if it's just you. <laughs> that would be high calories with the peanut butter. So um, put some in the refrigerator and save them for later. I know it's hard, but uh, I hope you enjoy my recipes. And um, it was great sharing with you. I love to share. There's a couple of questions for Anna. Are you willing to answer just a couple questions? Sure, I'll try. Um, Susan's here, the, the registered dietitian, if, if we need her. <laughs> okay, so one question is if you could share the name of the wild rice again. Oh, sure, where did we put it, Susan, right here. It's Ludberg, L-U-N-D-B-E-R-G. 
Second. The wild, wild blend. And like I said, I know I fought it at um, pavilions, I fought it at Sprouts, and I fought it at Whole Foods. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, uh -huh, have, sure. have you ever made this dessert with fresh fruit? Someone's asking. Uh, no, I have never done that. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how that would work. Okay. But try it and see. You never know. <laughs> Um, there's a couple people here that think you need to have your own YouTube channel of all <laughs> presentations. They really appreciate this. We're thankful that you've come on today. Um, you look healthy. Your husband looks spectacular. The diet is serving you well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I do, I do have a, um, a, a Facebook page. Um, you have to join it. I don't accept just everybody, and that was because in the beginning, People were wanting to come on and show horrible pictures of animals and take that drastic approach. And I didn't want that being shared on my page. Sure. So you do have to, ch to uh, join it. Um, and then I will accept you. So um, it's called Anna's Inspirational Healthy Kitchen. And I have hundreds of recipes on there. When you go on that page, if you go to the top in the icon, the magnifying glass and and click and the bar comes up, you can put, um, I don't know, nice cream, you can put, uh, you know, uh, burgers, whatever you wanna put, and those recipes I have will show up for that. So there are a lot of recipes on there. And I, be, I would accept you and be more than happy to have you join my page. Okay, so there's another question on that utensil that you use. What uh -huh. that gets everything out of the blender? Yes, this one. What's that called? This, um, I don't know what it's called, but it's by KitchenAid. And they make a lot of different brands. They're just long with a little scooper on the bottom to get into long things like that. And I picked this up at, I believe it was Ralph's. They, I mean, yeah, they have a whole kitchen section there. Okay, so then I've got another question here. <laughs> If you, I don't know if you know it or not, what's the fat content of the coconut milk in the can? So um, I can read that to you and it is, I will admit, it is a little high and, but that dish makes so much that you're really only gonna eat just a little bit. Right. You wouldn't be able to eat that whole dish. And, um, but it does make the cheese sauce creamy and taste good. So it is, uh, um, really uh, good for transitioning. But however, if you do have serious health problems and you're really watching your fat, you might not want to make this, you might want to make a different cheese sauce that um, wasn't as high. So um, one tablespoon is five grams of fat and zero trans fats. And then I have another question. What size baking dish do you have? I'm not sure if this is for which item? I'm not sure. Okay, so, uh, and also too, when you go to where um, John told you to get the recipes, they will tell you in detail how to make everything and the sizes and all that. So the peanut butter jellies are just in the eight by eight glass eight. baking pan. And then the casserole is in a nine by 13. So okay. the casserole, as you can see, it just makes a lot and you're not going to be I mean, it's so filling with all that rice and the broccoli. You just, I, I can only eat a small portion and I'm stuffed. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Any other for, questions? That's it. That looks like it's good. Thank you for okay. coming on today. We're very grateful. Okay. Great. Well, make the change, please. You will be so glad you did. You will feel so good. You will just, I'm, I'm telling you, I never thought you could reverse aging, but now I'm a believer that you can. I feel so good and I have so much energy and I would never go back. So thank you so much. Even if you have to make little steps forward, little at a time and don't do it overnight, make some steps are better than none. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. John, do you have any closing words for us? Uh, yes, absolutely. Let me get this camera switched around here. I'd like to tell you that we are absolutely thrilled that you have come today and that you are uh, considering improving your health. I'm so thankful to Dr. Tanner and I'm so thankful for Anna Evans. Um, 
uh, actually, I need to have that mic. I need to be close to that microphone while I talk. I, I'm so thankful for Dr. Tanner and for Anna Evans, um, who have very kindly shared their time and expertise. And I'm happy to announce that next month on September 26, we have Dr. Brian Blackburn, who uh, is a amazing uh, research PhD scientist, who's going to be talking about uh, defeating diabetes with plant-based cooking and we're going to talk uh, we're going to have a cooking demonstration by Sandy Spolino who has also come to pretty much everything that we've done over the past uh, 10 or 11 years she's a breast cancer survivor and is living a very healthy healthy life and uh, we're delighted to be able to share that with you you can find the flyer for that on the website get healthy Dot LA, and we will do our best to get this uh, recording posted up. Uh, we're going to post it uh, to a YouTube channel and then post the link to that on uh, the gethealthy.la website, and we hope that you'll enjoy it. So thank you very much, and blessings on you and yours, and live long and live healthy and live happy. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone that's joined us today. I just want to close off by saying our ultimate goal is to meet face to face when the health authorities say that's okay. And we will have live presentations. Uh, and then we'll also have uh, uh, demonstrations of the food samples for you to eat as well. So have a good rest of the afternoon. If you want any more information, you can go to gethealthy.la. That's our landing page. And I'm so glad you joined us today. Food is medicine, so I hope that uh, it goes well with you in your journey to become more healthy. 61.